Hi there, I'm Graham Fitch, uh, co-founder of the Online Academy, and welcome to July's Practice Clinic. Um, as you know, if you've been watching me before, we do a monthly uh, clinic where readers and subscribers to the Online Academy send me their questions about various spots in different pieces and ask for some advice and guidance on practice. It could be uh, technique, it could be pedaling, all these things come into the picture. So I'm going to start off with a question from Rob, who is working on Beethoven's German dance in G major W008. And he would like to know if I have any performance suggestions, especially for the B section, the trio. I'm struggling with two things, finding out an easier fingering and playing the left hand in such a way that it doesn't sound too mushy and makes the melody in the right hand more powerful. Well, let's go to the trio first then, Rob, since you, you're asking specifically about that um, in terms of problems. So what we get here is a, the left hand is written out in kind of a way that uh, tells us to hold on to the pinky finger note. So we uh, let me just play a bit of it. So that what the left hand has to do is to supply resonance by holding onto the pinky finger uh, for the whole measure. Let me just play left hand. Now, uh, let's just look at that for a moment. The fingering, I think, is kind of obvious there. It has to be 5-2-1 or 5-3-1 depending on the circumstance. That's a 5-2-1. That's if you block the chords out, that would be a good place to start. Let me just do that. That would be a 5-4-2, 5-3-1, 5-2-1, and then either 4-2, or come back to a 3-5, which may be simpler if you're going to do the repeat. Um, 2-4 would be nice if you were going on. It's up to you which one you do at the end. So blocking out is a good first uh, start point. Um, when I open that up, there's two things I've got to uh, be aware of in order to keep it feeling comfortable. The first is that the pinky finger needs to be able to sl slide in and out of the key, um, the length of the key, depending on what's going on above it. So in the first bar, I've got an F sharp to play with my thumb. What I want to avoid is a twist. So if my pinky is too far out on the on the white key, on the G, when I get to my F sharp, I'm going to have to twist the hand. Now that is a very bad uh, position for the hand to be in. You can test this out by, if you just keep your hand in a normal position and an aligned position where the hand is straight on with the arm, you can wiggle your fingers really fast. As soon as you do that, or that, uh, you've Im impeded the free flow of the, the movement, so you're going to be pinching and tightening up. Bad news. So there's an easy fix. That's the good news. There's an easy fix. All we need to do is to move in and up for the black key on the thumb. Now I come back out because I want my thumb to be on the white key there. Now you can already see when I play this next pinky, that movement in. So in order to achieve this, my pinky finger is able to slide in and out on the black key while holding down. So the other thing, the, the fifth finger does have to release because I've got to replay the note. So it's never going to be a full dotted minim, dotted half note. Release, release. So I release just after I've played the, uh, the thumb note on the top or, or the last quarter of the bar. So. Uh, if you wanted to practice that really carefully, really deliberately, really slowly, you'd count three and and release on the and. Let me show you. One and two and three and one and two and three and one. That would help you, I think, to coordinate the left hand with the fingering. Now, in terms of being expressive there, well, we've got legato phrase in the right hand, high note. I'm sensing there the E on the second beat, resolving to the D, and then the next phrase, the C to the B. So in 
terms of strong weak, we've got a, a statement which is stronger and an answer which has to be a little softer. There's nothing in the music to tell me that um, explicitly, but implicitly it's there uh, just because of the pitches. second half of the trio Beethoven shifts the accent onto the second beat it's a dance uh, it's a little bit of a um, curved ball there that we get two, two. So a little bit of an explosion there's a good example at the end where where a, a downbeat which is supposed to be a strong beat we'd actually play as a weak beat I wouldn't want because it's the end of a phrase I see a phrase mark there and the G is at the end of the phrase so just soften the end now in terms of the first part uh, Rob asks how to be expressive well Beethoven's given us a fair amount of information he said Sforzando and there's a suggestion that that could be piano there in brackets I love this first note this G. see there's a crescendo if ever there was one it's not marked with a crescendo but you've got the journey from the low G to the high G followed by a piano it's a little shape here and we don't have to play legato where Beethoven hasn't written an indication for slurs or staccatos um, we get to choose so now fortissimo a little bit of pedal even though there are staccato dots pedal pedal pedaling on each of the quarter notes there, each of the crotchets. So it's not a long pedal, though, you know, but I, I think... Uh, there's no marking there to change the dynamic from fortissimo, but just the nature of the, the writing, the texture, would seem to imply to me anyway a lesser dynamic marking in the second half of that phrase I would probably want to play a little bit more legato here and less legato at the end but that's just instinct um, and if the composer hasn't written anything you know the idea the usual idea is certain periods of music and this would be kind of uh, probably straddling that where the written note was uh, not connected so in other words the, the detached style so unless otherwise stated the quarter notes there the crotchets there might be detached slightly separated um, we know Beethoven was on the borderline there between the two styles. So those would be some ideas, Rob, there for, for your um, German dance. And then the next question is from Kim, who uh, is asking about Scarlatti Sonata in D. That's the Kirkpatrick 443 uh, or the Longo 418 um, bars one to six. She says here, looking at websites, it appears that some are crossing their right hand for the first note on the bass clef is this good for small hands yeah i think i i also looked on uh, youtube and i saw that there was at least one performance where uh, the the pianist instead of taking uh, let me show you so there, it's written here right hand and then the left hand has the same figure that's very challenging to do four note trills, particularly this one, 
we've got a black note there. Now one, two, one, two, three, four would be the fingering I would go with because I wouldn't really want to do that trill. Although you could do it between two, three, two, three. Now this is assuming you're doing a four note uh, ornament. If I'm to be honest, it, what it looks like is if somebody is doing this, let me see if I can replicate it. Um, yeah, it's hard to read it like that. And they're doing something like that. It looks like they can't manage those trills with the left hand. So it looks a little bit like it's a cop out. Um, I'm not saying you couldn't do it or it couldn't be done really well or that it's not a good idea. It just looks a little bit like, ah, I can't really manage my left hand there. So I'm just kind of cheating and playing it with, <laughs> with the right. It's nothing to do with whether you've got small hands or not. It's to do with the comfort of those ornaments. Now, OK, there are a couple of solutions to it. One is to do that, to do just that, which is to cross over and play with the uh, right hand and just uh, be happy with that. Do it unapologetically if you're going to do it. The other option is instead of doing the four note trill, which, which are challenging to, to play, um, you could do a three note trill. Which would be the note and then followed by the note above, followed by the main note again. Now we can do this in Scarlatti. We, we can't do this in Bach. That ornament doesn't really exist in Bach um, or French music. But in Italian, Spanish music, um, they didn't leave any, any ornament charts. And a lot of musicians are realising the, the little four note, uh, norm, what norm, would normally be a four note short trill as a three note short trill, which would make life easier. <laughs> would be feasible and then that would make the left hand slightly easier you still have the issue there of the what to do with the black note one and maybe changing the finger for just for that one so that would be possible now there are going to be some people who really want to play this piece but can't manage the four note trill can't manage the three note trill what do they do well if you've tried to do the four and the three note uh, uh, and you're still not able don't worry, you can still do it with an Acheca Torah. Now, what I'm doing there is playing the main note, the written note, and the note above together simultaneously. And then I'm letting go of the uh, upper note. Now, if you do that, um, well, by releasing the Acecatura immediately, you create a, a, this, a similar kind of snappy accent the, that Scarlatti was obviously after there at that point. Now, I have a, a very close friend who is a fantastic harpsichord player, professional harpsichord player, and, and uh, of the highest order, and he absolutely is, would rather hear that than a, a bad, um, you know, th four or three note trill. So. Consider that as, as an option. But to f finish your question, in, in principle, there's nothing wrong with crossing uh, redistribution. It's actually fine. Um, you've just got to do it in such a way that feels good to you. And you do it. You must do it unapologetically. Otherwise, it's going to cause tension in your mind and therefore in your body. So Margaret in Albanith Cordoba. How would I practice bars 77 and 78? And then she goes on to ask about 125 to 132 in order to make the top line legato without losing the bass dotted quarter note or the tied dotted bass note. Right. It's actually a very easy solution here, Margaret. Uh, you won't lose it if you take the upper note here in the left hand. Let me do it slowly for you so you can see. So in my right hand, I'm playing the E octave. So my right hand does this. It's just played that E anyway, the thumb. So then my pedal is down on the each crotchet, each quarter note I change. Change. 
change, 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 but hold the, the pedal for that bar. The rests don't mean literal silence, don't do this. It doesn't mean that, it means just play those notes lightly. You don't need to shorten them. Job done. It means that you can hold on to the bass note, you won't lose it at all. There's no awkward stretching and there's no awkwardness there. The right hand's already in place. Simple. Now the next spot, uh, bar 125, yeah, no, it's written in a slightly confusing way because again, we've got rests in the left hand. If you look closely at the notation there, you'll see that you've got on the bottom a quarter note stem down with rest, 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 yeah, and then above it we've got this rhythm, so, and then above that, a legato line that's marked with a phrase mark, a, a big long phrase, um, which therefore has to be played legato, but I'm needing to lift up my thumb and my pinky in order to find the next position. So th therefore the pedal has to be part of this story. Now this is kind of typical romantic um, piano writing. The rests don't mean literal silence. It, to my mind, in this instance, we play the B at the beginning of the bar, with the weight of a quarter note, not the weight of a dotted half, but the weight of a quarter, and then keep the pedal for the whole bar. It's absolutely fine and really the best solution. In that fashion, now what I'm doing, let's look at the left hand a little bit in a little bit more detail. Not a dotted half, otherwise it would sound like this. Can you hear there? I'm making my bass note much firmer uh, to illustrate the difference between what's written here, quarter note, um, and what could have been written, dotted half note. In other words, don't make so much of the bass. Go for the brilliance of the right hand. So I'm playing these light. Interesting, isn't it? We see a marking there of fortissimo, FF. And we tend to think FF tells us to play as loud as possible every note, right? But if I'm speaking to you really loudly, there are going to be some syllables that are going to be weak. There are some syllables that are going to be piano. So, you know, let's look at this rationally for a moment. Let me miss out the, the frog music in the middle, the, the hopping stuff, and just play the bass note and the melody line. <laughs> already achieved fortissimo uh, without those notes even being present so that means that when I put them in I don't have to make them uh, don't have to play them at full tilt <laughs> Now, Adam is looking at Schubert's B-flat impromptu. I'm a bit stuck with how to figure out the pedaling for the theme. I'd like to pedal half bars, but I assume the staccato dots and the semiquaver rests, uh, 16th note rests, imply not to. I'm also struggling with the left hand in the minor key variation. Okay, uh, let's look at this, Adam. So the, yes, I think what confuses people and may have been a factor in influencing the editor of this, particular edition, I'm not going to say what it is, uh, who've, who've been, who's been incredibly squeamish about his, his or her pedaling for this. The pedaling that's marked in here is pedal for the first note and then release the pedal. So you get this kind of, for me, impossibly dry, mistaken um, idea of what that staccato dot means. 
Very often in music, a staccato dot will tell us a sort of accent. Um, it tells us to release the key upwards, but not necessarily to be without the pedal. And there's a very good example of this from Chopin, the E flat nocturne. <laughs> I'm talking about the pinky notes, bass, chord, chord, bass, chord, chord. Each of those um, notes is written with a staccato dot and a pedal mark to, to sustain the, the sound through. So I think we'd be completely justified in pedaling by the half bar. So for me, all that staccato dot means is give a little stress on the bass note. If I would play now one pedal for each half bar, right, it's, it was going pretty well until that last bar where I don't think I can get away with in one pedal, nor do I think I can get away with that in one pedal. In fact, I know I can't. Now, had he written, let's say, in the style, a, a, a different style, maybe there's an octave down there, and the tempo were broader, then yes, you could get away with it. But because it's only one bass note and a relatively thin accompaniment, uh, I personally wouldn't do that, although that's less terrible than be unfeasible. So what would I do in that point, at that point, the beginning of bar four? You could do, a, you can't see my foot, but what I did there was a little kind of change. Uh, I want to say kind of change. It wasn't a complete up-down, it was more of a vibration on the D perhaps. Sorry, on the B here. Although you could do a complete change if you wanted. You could just do this. Change, change, change. Now, two options here as I see it. One is to pedal each. Um, change, change. You wouldn't need to do it until the second, uh, till the D, B flat. Huh? Change, change. The other is potentially just to release the pedal uh, at the beginning of the beat there. Without any pedal, and then just pedal after that last uh, eighth to give you a connection. Now here, change again here in bar eight. I don't think you could get away with this. It's too much. Change. So the general recipe is one pedal per half bar, except in these various spots where that would be too much, in which case we have to ad adapt the, the pedaling plan, uh, either by changing more frequently or by just um, fancy footwork, uh, maybe a little vibration of the foot rather than a complete change. Oh yes, the minor key variation, um, the left hand there. Yeah, so, so we've got this kind of sad melody now. Oops. I meant to do this. Now you've got a, f a few options there for, for rhythmic organization. You know, with, with Schubert's music, when we get a dotted eighth, semi uh, uh, sixteenth. Uh, could do the 16th after the last triplet note or we could assimilate and play together together but this is a two against three here this E flat has to come halfway in between just like a normal uh, cross rhythm there so it's it's the, the question is do we assimilate the dotted 
eighth, sixteenth rhythm, or do we play it as a triplet? And it doesn't really matter. Whichever one you want to go with, as long as you're consistent through the variation, you'll be okay. So let's just look at the left hand there. The left hand has, in terms of content, a bass note on each half bar point, plus harmonic filler but it's just it's a little bit more than just harmonic because you've got on the top melodic fragment and then, which has to be shaped somewhat and also projected somewhat so for practice purposes I would practice even though you're going to end up playing with it with a slight portato quality in the hand you'll end up doing this it's useful to practice legato no pedal to start with can you hear what I'm doing I'm joining the top finger uh, to create the melodic line but releasing the underneath two fingers so I can give a little shape do that here you wouldn't be able to but most of the time depending on which fingering you're doing you you could do uh, another thing that could be useful I say could be because you know this would suit some people and it might be a, a pain for others uh, to do something like this to make a little exercise see what I'm doing I'm playing the underneath notes twice Two for the price of one. That helps me to control the two elements in the right hand. Not the right hand, the top of the left hand. I mean, it feels like right hand. So it, it helps me to control the legato-ness of the top and the releases underneath. Then when I get good at it, I can um, just play with a detached portato style and then I can add my pedal you don't want to overkill with that it just needs to be just suggested underneath just very subtly done Carol um, is writing about the June Barcarolle from Tchaikovsky's The Seasons. Um, my teacher tells me I need more imagination in the opening of Tchaikovsky's June Barcarolle. There are hardly any dynamic markings in my score, so I'm not really sure what I need to do to improve this. Well, okay, Carol, I haven't heard you play, so I don't know specifically what it is, but all I can do is to give you a kind of stream of consciousness um, a little walkthrough of the first part of this piece and um, in the hope that you, you get some ideas from it. <laughs> so we've got this boat song, we've got this kind of lilting from the left hand. A barcarolle. Think of a gondola on a, a Venetian canal. Uh, we feel the kind of ebbing and flowing of the, the boat as it moves across. So already that feels good to me in terms of the way it's moving. Right now, the, the line on the top, even though there are no um, dynamic indications other than piano at the beginning, has to be, surely, more than piano. projecting the quavers, the eighth notes on the top, but I'm also shaping them in a kind of vocal style. So that means no singer would ever sing these equally. That sounds like a robot. So how would I bend those to make them sound natural? Uh, I don't know, 
Let me experiment. So I'm, I'm phrasing with little kind of inflections, crescendo, diminuendos, but I'm also bending the eighth. So maybe the average speed for the eighth notes is this, but at their fastest at the slowest. So ti ta 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 ya pa pam pam could could be that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily come up with a recipe that you're going to use every single time, but just experiment with with bending a little bit. Uh, distinct levels of sound high level so sorry the high level would be here and then medium lowest so strong weaker weakest just because of the natural design of the music there you can see it falling you can hear it falling and then Yeah, so that would be a very natural way of doing that. Uh, there's also a little bit of dialogue. So if you just extract those uh, lines, so the top right hand, the top left hand. Again, I'm going for the interesting notes, C sharp is the softest because it's the least interesting it's the most um, relaxed note oh, there's tension in those two notes de-stress there so when I put that all together now that's too much time but I'm, I'm giving the idea that I I'm able to be a bit free what happens afterwards So he's changing a little bit the, the the line at the end. This is what we had first time. Here's what we've got the second time. Just one little note change from an F sharp to an F natural gives him the option of a moment of sunshine. B flat major. So that's the smiley emoji is near to it's a little bit like the sun comes out and then the sky comes a bit gray and then the rain starts sad face right and then to be played with a little bit of weight, a little bit of a tenuto, because we've got two harmonies underneath it. So I would go toward the B flat here. there forwards and backwards um, let this move and again a little bit of dialogue just between the the right hand fragments and the left hand so I would voice this a little bit to the top. The thing I missed out that I wanted to say is if you look at the very footnote at the very beginning, this is the um, epigram that Tchaikovsky used to base this, this composition on. Let us go to the shore 
There the waves will kiss our feet. With mysterious sadness, the stars will shine down on us. So I think this gives us two images. For me, it gives me two images. The water image, where there are waves that come in and waves that come out. So you've got this feeling of the tide moving uh, through the piece. And then, what, what was the other thing? Yes, with mysterious sadness, the prevailing mood is sad, even though we've got uh, an episode which is a little bit more pastoral. That spot, and also... There's a little bit there of the, the rustic happy dance, but mostly the, the mood is one of sadness. Um, I hope that has at least addressed your questions, if not completely answered them. Uh, so thank you for sending them in. I will now leave you in peace. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you very soon for our next practice clinic.